Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Laura, for the warm introduction. Uh, happy Champaign-Urbana Ag Tech Week. Um, as Laura mentioned, there's a week-long celebration of a lot of amazing events, uh, something we started three years ago, and this summit is really our flagship event in the week, so it's been nice to engage and learn uh, with everyone today, and if you can't tell, uh, us here in Champaign-Urbana, we get pretty excited over Ag Tech, so um, it, it's been really fun, and I'm very excited to be here uh, with Dennis Beard. Uh, to talk about uh, ag tech investment just sort of in general, uh, which is a very hot topic, but one that we're particularly interested in here in the Champaign-Urbana area as well. Uh, so Dennis, Laura already sort of gave you a warm introduction, but if you don't mind, just tell us a little bit more about yourself and your role at Sarah Ventures. Okay, welcome everybody, this is great. Isn't this just awesome? I'm so happy to be here. Um, so I'm Dennis Beard. I grew up uh, about an hour west of here in farm country in Christian County and went to Millican and uh, ended up in Champaign to work for a tech company as, uh, as its controller. I have a financial background, then went back to University of Illinois for a master's degree in business and bought a company and had uh, 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 blessed to have some success with that and had some friends that started a firm that some of you may have heard of um, that's headquartered right down the road called Open Prairie Ventures. And I started out as an advisor and then worked for Open Prairie for a few years and still have a relationship with them. And, and their latest fund does only ag investments. So we work pretty closely in a few things together. That firm's based in Effingham. Uh, but Open Prairie made an early investment in a company in the research park, thanks to Laura Frerichs, called Eyesight. And uh, Tim Hare uh, and Gary Durick had started that company. So we made an investment with that. And... Uh, and uh, struck a little uh, lightning there with that. And within 18 months, had a nice exit and some money in our hip pocket. And without going through all the details, it was all, all in the positive, but I ended up partnering with Tim to start doing some consulting in the firm Tim started, Sarah Ventures. And a lot of people we, we went to to see if they could um, use our help, what they really needed help with was finding money. And so we would go around to the investors that were in eyesight, uh, Tim and Gary's old company, or people that I knew, and we formed our first little fund, which we called Sarah Capital One. Five million dollars. If you know anything about the venture world, that's, that's not a micro VC. That's tiny, tiny, ultra micro VC, nano VC. There's a new term for you. And uh, we invested almost entirely in University of Illinois developed technologies. So people that were either licensing technologies or were working at the university or students that were fresh out of the programs. And we have had a nice little run with that, that fund. It's actually still alive. I think there are five companies left in it, and a couple of them are doing really well. So we're excited about that. But along the way, we've grown, and we've added more partners and more employees and what we call venture partners, which is sort of a term on in our industry for part-time partners. Got a couple of great venture partners in our firm as well. So I think if you count everybody up, I think we're at 11 people right now, and we have an office in Chicago. We're still headquartered here. Um, we have a, also have a presence in Southern California and in Utah now, and uh, uh, we're getting some pretty good recognition around the country, so it's a, it's a really nice thing. And then just most recently, um, through kind of a little bit of cajoling from a couple of our uh, investors who were very interested in ag, had approached us about helping them make some ag investments, and after all these discussions, finally decided, let's just do an ag fund and you invest in the ag fund, which they did. And we uh, uh, got the message out to some others. And uh, we finished raising just recently uh, what's a little more than $45 million in money for early stage ag companies. And we've started investing as we, as we were raising the money we were investing. So I think we have 11 companies in that portfolio right now. And uh, really exciting. Good stuff. So you had previously invested in some ag tech companies at right. Sarah, um, but what made you sort of take the jump to focus on the Sarah venture and start the actual ag tech fund? Well, there were two things, Carly. One was that uh, we had a couple of our, our existing investors that were wanting to concentrate more into ag and were asking us for help. They understood a lot of the technologies in the markets, but they didn't understand the investing process and due diligence and the things that we do where we get to know the entrepreneurs and, and try to understand the company and whether this is going to be a maybe lower than average risk, et cetera. That helped a lot. The other thing is, as we were thinking about forming the fund, we went back and looked at the 11 ag companies we had invested in, many of which were right here in this community, and we said, if this were turned into a hypothetical pro forma portfolio, this would be a very good portfolio. We'd had a couple of really nice exits out of it. 
Uh, we had minimal losses, and we had a ton of potential left in the companies that were going, and that is still the case. We've had one nice exit since then. It was a company that originally launched in St. Louis and moved to Chicago called Label Insight, and they were uh, uh, data on consumer products. I, I think you could, uh, I think they had the capability to track about 10,000 attributes of one consumer package good where it came from, what the ingredients are, uh, whether the soybeans were grown organically that are in this mayonnaise, that kind of thing. Um, in fact, I say that because Hellman's mayonnaise was one of the first products that came on to, to try that product. Um, so we had some really nice success and thought, okay, we've got a track record that we can show. Agrable was the one I, I spent a lot of time with that was right here in the research product, which was uh, nice for all of us. And they were purchased by Nutrien uh, four years ago, three and a half years ago. So maybe for some of the, the startups in the room or, or those watching online, mm -hmm. let's talk a few specifics about the fund. About the fund. Um, so what sort of companies are you looking for? Right. Um, and tell us about maybe like the, the general stages of those companies and some of the attributes that you would, you would consider. Okay, I'll start with the second question first because that's a little easier for me. Um, we, we are um, doing something a little different than the earlier funds that we've uh, reserved a pretty good sized chunk of the fund for what you might call Series A companies. So these are companies that have uh, revenue typically at a pretty serious level, uh, often a million dollars a year or more. And we can write a pretty big check to come into those. We know they're more valuable at that stage. They're gonna have a higher valuation and we're prepared to put more money into those companies and prepared to follow on as they raise uh, future money. So that's something we haven't done a lot of in our previous funds. We still earmarked a fair chunk of the fund for about 10 or 12 early stage companies at the seed stage and seed plus stage where we can write a check as uh, say a $250,000 check to get in and we might earmark another half million or maybe even more to do follow-on rounds. Whereas in the, coming in the A, we might write an initial check anywhere from 500,000 to a million and a half for that first check. So it can get pretty big. Then on top of that, and we can explore this more a little later, uh, later uh, we're also a big uh, uh, funding source into the Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator. And um, in fact, we're the largest investor in that fund, and that's doing um, quite a few seed and even pre-seed and pure startup companies are coming through that program um, that's, that's based here, uh, actually in the research park, uh, run by Jack Mark, a former Agrable Nutrien. Uh, you met Jack earlier. And um, so we're getting our foot in the door in a lot of uh, uh, well-vetted early-stage companies. Uh, I don't know if Jack's been able to tout this, but I'm going to steal a little bit of his thunder. We had, we've got an upcoming cohort. Uh, we're going to have five companies in that cohort. We had over 300 companies apply for that slot. So that's a, it's a really cool thing to have that many uh, good, interesting tech startups applying um, to come into that. So Sarah, uh, or, uh, Sarah Ag Tech fund is a part of all those by virtue of participating in that partnership, we actually get equity in all those companies. Well, I was gonna talk about it later, but let's just talk about it now. Okay. Um, so yeah, three, three years ago, actually, for our first Ag Tech Week, we were making the announcement about the accelerator. So all of the partners that have been involved uh, working directly with Generator are, are pretty excited about what's, what's happened to date and, and what the potential for the future is. So um, you were very involved in helping bring uh, the Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator to fruition here in our community. So can you tell us a little bit about that process, um, why it's worked, and um, also why you thought it would be successful here in Champaign-Urbana? Well, uh, there are, uh, most people in this room know that this is pretty natural eco center for, for ag technology, not just row crops, but all kinds of things. A lot of it has to do with the University of Illinois, but a lot of companies that are located in the area, in, in the research park, in Champaign-Urbana area, in Decatur, in Bloomington, we've got a lot of depth of skill set here. We've got an educated workforce. We've got Parkland College, which was recently ranked the number two ag school and the community colleges in the country. We've got a, a ton of depth here. Uh, I saw Professor Bruce Sherrick give a talk to our breakfast meeting here about a year and a half, two years ago, and he had these heat maps showing all these important factors about ag and the hottest spot in the world was this Illinois, Iowa band uh, that we're right in the middle of. And I came away from that thinking, we're right in the space for, we need to do more in this area. And um, we had been talking at Sarah about participating more, um, uh, more into an ag tech accelerator. Uh, we, we, I, th I think with the incubator program in the research park, I mean, we feel like, you know, we, we love this world without we, we ought to get an, an ag tech accelerator so we started talking to some of the big accelerator programs in the country like tech stars 
and generator. And there are over 300 programs. And uh, we had uh, invested in companies that graduated from several of these accelerator programs. And we seemed to really click with the people at Generator out of Wisconsin. And they were not backing an, Excel an ag tech program. And when we brought that up uh, to Troy Vossler, one of the founders, he was all over it. And, um, and, and, and off we went. And we like to be the first. So. And, and we got to be the first. We like to be the first. It's pretty exciting. So that company, uh, uh, they hired Jack, and, and they're running it. We're an investor in it along with others. And um, w what's happening is uh, they run a couple programs a year uh, based right here uh, where one is for super early stage companies and startups, and we're going to try to have a little more local emphasis on that. Not necessarily University of Illinois, but I think it'll be heavy with University of Illinois, but it really downstate Illinois type companies. And then we have the, the, the flagship program. The first one's a seven-week program. The flagship program's a 12-week program. So companies are selected to come in. They, they network. They find mentors. They meet investors. Uh, they just get opportunities to, to learn about whatever it is that's that's they're trying to get past at this stage of the company, whether that's get their first sales or, or um, master their technology, something like that. And in the 12-week program, the, the, um, the accelerator fund puts $100,000 into each company. If they're raising around, it goes under those terms. If they're not raising around, we lend them the money on a convertible note, which will convert into the round, the next round that they do. So we like to participate in that because we get a piece of equity, but we really like to participate in it because we're staying on top of the, of the technology that's happening and uh, what's hot and meeting really awesome teams. Uh, so, so imagine uh, Jack and his team are boiling down from over 300 applicants to five here in the next few days. This, this next group's gonna kick off at the end of March. And we, we try to help where we can, and it's a little bit overwhelming. When you get down to 25, you can just throw a dart. You're going to get a really good company uh, out, of, out of that group of 300. Uh, there are a lot of strong companies. I wanted to add, I, I wanted to go back on that earlier question about what kind of companies we're looking for, and this also impacts the accelerator. We identified when we were putting our thesis together for the Sarah Fund, you know, what's driving ag tech investment right now? It's up uh, nationwide, worldwide, and... Um, Ten years ago, it wasn't even much of a category for venture firms to invest in ag. It was happening, but it wasn't happening at the scale that we're seeing it today. But one of the things that we noticed, uh, we've gotten a couple of calls in the office from coastal VC firms. If, if you don't know venture very well, there's a huge concentration of the venture money comes out of the Bay Area in California and another big pocket in the Boston area. So the coasts are, are where most of the money is. In Illinois, you know, the, in the Midwest, we have 20% of the population, 20% of the patents filed, and about 5% of the venture capital money. So it's underserved here, and we've always felt like this was a good place for us to be. But then we were getting calls from coastal VC firms I mean, this is not, I'm not kidding. One of the questions was, do you know any farmers? Because <laughs> we'd like to talk to them and ask some questions. We're looking at this ag thing. And we thought, well, you know, maybe we ought to do more in this area. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and so we come up with a thesis, and a lot of it has to do with the, these factors. A lot of technology has been around, and, and ag, in some sense, has been slow to adopt some of the technologies. Ag's been out in front in things like genetics for quite a while, but other areas like some of the data sciences, it's been a little behind uh, other industries in adopting it. And then you, you take um, uh, the millennial generation, which is a big bulge in the population, and millennials love them or hate them, and I love a lot of millennials, don't, don't get the wrong impression, that's right. They're getting a little pickier about um, their consumer uh, choices in a good way. I mean, they're wanting healthy foods, they're wanting information, they don't want to tear up the, the, the earth in the process. And so there's this pressure to solve these problems and still provide uh, affordable food, um, tasty, healthy, clean food. And uh, we, th we think that's important. And you start, then you, then you throw in um, the impact of climate change, which is a, you know, a, is a bigger impact than I would have imagined just a few short years ago on what's going on in our industry here. I, I, uh, Aaron, who's going to be your next uh, panelist, and I were over at the Genomic uh, Biology Institute uh, yesterday looking at some of the research they're doing and the impact on, uh, on crops by, by global uh, climate change is, is, is fascinating to me. And, and so we're, we're thinking about that when we look at these companies. And then marrying them with all these, these concepts. Then we had COVID come in, which forced a lot of people to rethink how they live their lives. And all this is sort of juiced this whole industry. 
And so we've got these forces on the one hand, and then we have all these new technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning and imaging technologies that are really way ahead of where they were just a few years ago, and autonomous vehicles on air and in the ground, and, and, and bright people, and you've met some of them today, are starting to put these things together. And, and all of a sudden, uh, neat things are going to happen because of that. So we're looking, th those things I just described are what you would read if you read our pitch deck to our investors on what kind of companies we're looking for. If they bring this kind of information and these methods of new technologies together to help solve the, these forces that are coming to play. And I think, I think it's going to be a winner. So all of those things and then a lot of what's been discussed on different panels today is really driving this momentum and it increases by a lot of billions <laughs> each year. Mm -hmm. So do you think that momentum is going to continue? And also, what do you think are some of the spaces that we're going to see that maybe aren't as focused on right now? Ooh. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Do I think it'll continue? I think it will continue. I think we're still catching up in the ag and food world to some other industries like uh, just generally data, uh, some of the biopharma, biotech stuff, and some of the healthcare. But I think eventually we're going to hit some area where we're going to come and go in cycles like those others tend to do. I've had a lot of uh, experience working in the healthcare side and it kind of ebbs and flows in favor of the investment community and different forces uh, come to play. Regulatory ha has an impact on that as well. Um, and maybe we'll settle down a little bit, but I, can, I see it growing because, I mean, we all know the needs. Uh, when I was in healthcare, we used to talk about the aging of the population and, you know, by the year 2050, you know, there are going to be all these old people, you know, I'll be one of them hopefully. And, and, uh, and um, you know, you can't argue with that trend. And here we talk about how, how much food we're going to need by the year 2050. That's still there, but all of a sudden things are really shaking up. And I, and I think uh, awareness of, of the impact on the climate and the COVID pandemic and all these new technologies have just brought it to life. But I think it's going to grow. So what's going to be big in the future? Um, well, uh, moving things cheaper, moving things without uh, harming the environment is, is really big in our eyes in the, in the near term. And, and by cheaper, I'm talking about some of the logistics things and, and tracking uh, information that, that just make it easier to get from the field to the grocery store or to the restaurant or to your kitchen. I don't know. Maybe well, that's too simplistic. <laughs> You, you see a lot of companies um, or a lot of pitches come across your desk, right, in your role at Sarah. Now, of course, with the Sarah Ag Tech Fund, your engagement with the Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator. So what are some of the things that really stand out to you about the companies coming across your desk? Um, and also, what can a company do right to grab your attention right out of the gate? Oh, that, that, that's a really good question that we could, we could write a paper on that together. Um, a couple things that really uh, grab my attention when I'm looking at um, a company's first pitch. A lot of times people approach us, usually from a referral from somebody that knows us, and they send along a pitch deck, and we'll flip through that and then set up a Zoom call and get to know them. If it looks like we might be the right stage and they might be the right stage, and then we'll set up a meeting so they meet all of our team, and we can fling questions at them really hard for an hour, an hour and a half, and then see where it goes after that. Um, if we've we're seeing teams that have been through incubators and accelerators, sometimes multiple times through accelerators. That's really big. That shows, if nothing else, that they're hungry to get out there and keep learning and improving their business. So we like that. It's not a requirement, but we like that. Um, we like teams that are, uh, this, I've been t saying this story for a long time, and it's still absolutely totally true. Teams that um, uh, are okay with working with other investors coming into the firm and they either have a really solid team that's balanced and can work together and they've got that good high energy vibe and they believe in what they're doing or at a minimum they're the kind of people that are really willing to build that team around them. So sometimes we get in early enough it might be a couple of uh, professors or engineers and, and they don't have anybody with sales or maybe finance experience or anything like that. It's okay as long as you can tell that they're willing to move in on that. Um, a big magic thing for me, and I know this is hard to hear if you're an early stage company, is if you've got some sales to customers who are paying real money and aren't related to you, you know, by even you know, by marriage or anything, that's important. I love seeing customer adoption. It's, it's really rare at the early stage that you've got your model perfectly figured out. 
So I don't usually expect that sales model to be worked out and you tinker with it and you change your pricing or you change, uh, we're gonna give away the razor and start charging for the razor blades kind of thing. But if they have revenues and customers that really want it, I like to see businesses that were born of a need rather than I invented this and now I need to find somebody that might wanna buy it. So not to put you on the spot with yeah. like a community pitch or anything like that, uh -huh. but you, you probably have a lot of interesting conversations given, you know, you're, you're seeing companies that are uh, global startups. So mm -hmm. um, you also mentioned you get calls from the coasts about, do you know any farmers? <laughs> um, so w what do you tell people about, you know, Illinois in particular in this area and why it makes sense to come here and, and do it here or build your company here? Well, um I think this applies for sure to row crops and some of the animal sciences, but I think it goes beyond that. We've got a great workforce here. We've got a wonderful uh, lifestyle here. And it's a very affordable community to live in. And if, if you need help with the technology, if you need help with finance, uh, you're not very far uh, from, from some first-rate help. And, and keep in mind, St. Louis and Chicago are nearby, and those, those are also hubs in the finance industry. Uh, it, it, um, this, this really is a stacked ecosystem. And uh, people that have not been here before, we've had this experience with a few people in the accelerator. They come in from out of town for meetings in the accelerator program, and they, they think, wow, this, this is really happening here. Um, early on, when I was doing some advisory work for Open Prairie Ventures, uh, we were looking at a uh, crop protection uh, program uh, from another state, and um, we needed some technology help. There's just no way uh, any one technical person, and I'm not a technical person on finance, could understand all the technologies that we see. You know, if you're a physicist who also packed, managed to get a master's degree in biology and chemistry and mathematics and, you know, crop science, you could go down, you're just not going to know all this stuff, so you, you outreach. And, we did a little outreach to get some help looking at this crop protection program and ended up get, getting some absolutely fabulous first-rate advisors who jumped in and helped us get that. So I tell entrepreneurs, you don't have to worry about getting technical help. But uh, Jack uh, at the incubator, or at the accelerator, has said this, uh, uh, University of Illinois is the only university that has a top five computer science and top five ag school in the country. So talking about depth of technology help, you know, we've got it here in spades. So, and, and the lifestyle ain't bad here either. It's not, no. We got some good restaurants. And good beer, Enjoy right? Enjoy and good beer. Yep. Um, all right, well, there's certainly been a lot accomplished. There's a lot of potential. Um, and so, you know, I look forward to working with you, Dennis, and others here in this room on advancing our ag tech sector here in the community. And I think you'll be hearing some exciting announcements um, coming up in the next few weeks, I think, right? I, I think so. All right. Um, we'll, we'll just leave that out there at that. Um, and then I think we'll open it up for questions, uh, questions now. There's one over here on the right. My right. Sorry, Eric, I want to make sure you're live. Appreciate it. Eric Barnard with Farmers Risk. You mentioned earlier that you really like to see companies who are at a revenue stage or they have taken checks from real customers. Say you're at a seed, seed plus kind of phase. Mm -hmm. You're talking with potential customers um, and you're at a, a position where they are actually potentially interested in becoming an early stage investor versus a customer or maybe an advisory board member. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice as to which way you, you'd like to see that go? To, to, to picking, to partnering with somebody who might be an investor or might be an advisor or might even be a customer. Um, we have seen that in several of our deals. And um, uh, the pluses are sort of obvious. I mean, if you can get somebody who's that enthusiastic about your product that they'd like to put money in as well. I'm working on a deal, it's a, a legacy deal I have from about four years ago that's a healthcare deal, and we're pitching a big system to a hospital chain, and they came back and said, 
we'd like to we'd like to invest $2 million in your firm. So we're thinking, how could we go wrong? And in that case, I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, but you also need to watch out that you don't have a conflict of interest when it comes time to say an exit plan or if having them uh, closely involved might keep you from getting sales to others. So you have to ask yourself that question. One other little tidbit, I was on the board of a company one time that was a highly complex medical device system. And we had two customers who had invested significant money in our company, and by virtue of that, they got observation rights to come to the board meetings. And we had to have start having meetings the night before the board meeting to talk about our quality control problems, because <laughs> we didn't want our customers to know that the machine was having some breakdown issues. We got those solved pretty quickly, but we just didn't feel comfortable talking about some of these problems in front of our customers. But yeah, I think it's, a, it's not a bad thing. And in fact, uh, I think you can wave that flag a little bit if you have said, hey, they liked our product well enough that they wanted to invest. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Eric, I'm gonna go back to you for a second. You have a new company that yeah. you're founding. Give us a 30-second pitch. <laughs> so I, I think uh, what we're doing at Farmers Risk, so much of what we've talked about at, at a, summits like this has been focused on production ag, securing bushels, and making sure that those bushels are predictable year in, year out. But we're focused on the price side of that. You know, if, if revenue is really bushels times price, we're trying to ensure that farmers can manage, secure, and predict what that price side of that equation is gonna be. So I can, I can go into more, but we'll save that for the happy hour, so. Okay, Thanks. talk to Eric later. Uh, I'll also say Eric's question reminded me that Dennis is an entrepreneur in residence, so for anybody who's in our Champaign-Urbana community or if you're a client of the FAST Center working on SBIR awards or you're at Enterprise Works, you can come ask for time with Dennis. And he's just a wealth of information, one of the most trustworthy and humble guys you can get advice from. So take him up on that and uh, it's a great program that we have. Any other questions in the audience? I know we have startups out there that might be looking for investments, so that's a good chance to ask Dennis on his fund, too. Shy group. Hopefully, think of it, if you, if you don't have it, I got one over here, and I'll say, if you don't have a question for Dennis now, think about it for Aaron on the next one for us, too, yeah. You made a comment about wanting to see companies born of a need, not just uh, something cool they built that they want to try to sell. Right. Um, is there anything that is glaring to you right now where there's a need that you would be super excited to see someone uh, be innovating to address it? Um, that's a, I, I'm going to cheat on this one and tell you that a company came to us um, looking for funding that was is addressing something that was really bugging me. Um, right or wrong, I like my hamburgers. And this whole climate change thing is a bit troubling if you look at the source of carbon and the, the beef industry and the dairy industry. And Open Prairie Ventures, our friends uh, down the street, I don't know if anybody, if Jason or Jim, I know Jim's not here, he's in Chicago today, but uh, down, the, down the road in Effingham, they, they were looking at a company in Kansas City that's doing some work using uh, modern genetics and genomics and in vitro fertilization to reduce the carbon footprint of dairy cattle and beef cattle. And uh, I was knocked out at how dedicated this management team is doing it right, and they're doing it now. They, this is the company that's the furthest along of anybody I'd ever invested in, 12 million in revenues this last year. I don't think it's okay for me to say that. And uh, and and going, going big, uh, we've looked at a lot of alternative proteins, really cool stuff. I mean, how many of you would think that uh, duckweed that's growing out in your pond, duckweed can double every, every uh, 48 hours in the right growing conditions. And there are some folks that are turning duckweed into uh, uh, protein to supplement uh, some of the burgers and things that are out there. Um, but um, I, I think that was a big one for me personally, and, and I grabbed it. I, I'd welcome more opportunities that are similar to that. Um, you, you have to be a little bit passionate about certain things uh, to be successful at it. And so I'm trying to look at things that get me excited. The good news at Sarah is there are really five partners when you throw in Karen. Karen O'Connor is our venture partner in Chicago. She's on the faculty at Kellogg, U of I alum. And she's really a partner, but she's splitting her time between us and teaching. So you hit one of the partners and we all have different passions that all fit within that umbrella. But that's one of mine is is uh, is this uh, carbon footprint um, and the, and the um, earth damage by the, the uh, beef industry. 
and I think it's going to get better. I think I think they're coming up with some really good ideas. Okay, raise your hand if you've got any other questions or put them in. We're good. Okay, any parting wisdom, Dennis, as I guess you've been helping companies here in our community for a long time. Yeah. What would you what would you tell them to do if they're starting from scratch, they're commercializing research or some other you know, university founder, what are, what are a couple of things you commonly advise? Well, first of all, take advantage of the resources that are available. If you're in the Champaign area, Champaign-Urbana area, take advantage of, of the uh, uh, accelerator programs that we have, uh, uh, and there are various programs, not, not just our Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator, but, but uh, uh, some of the other programs through Engineering School, the University of Illinois, some of the community programs. Take advantage of the Incubator, Enterprise Works, if you can qualify for that. Take advantage of, of the networks around here and just try to keep grabbing advice. Um, one thing I love, and we talk about this openly, we're assessing management teams when, when they're pitching to us. And let's face it, you gotta be a little bit crazy to be an entrepreneur, and I can say that having been one. You gotta be a little bit crazy to do that. You've gotta be kind of obsessed. But you also have to be a little bit humble and realize that no matter how good you are, you do not have all the answers, and you, you're constantly trying to seek this advice. So we've got a great community for taking advantage of that here, and so that, that's, a, that's a big deal to me, try to grab that. Okay, thank you, Carly. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate your advice and congratulations on your new AgTech Fund.